Oceaneering has shown an ability to be creative, to be responsive, and to move with the times. As things evolve out there, I think that we will be players because we're always making better what we did before. Hey, I'm Bill Mallon, Vice President of Global Marketing Communications at Oceaneering, and today we have a very special guest, Kevin McAvoy, former CEO and our current chairman of the board of directors. Kevin, how are you, sir? I'm perfect. All right, so I've got lots of questions for you. Kevin, I've heard people say, and I, I agree with this, Kevin is the Oceaneer's Oceaneer. You've had a, a I mean, you started at eight, I guess, well, what, 80, so 84 was at... was when Oceaneering... So when you went to acquire the company, okay. I started uh, at, at Solo Social Systems in June of 1979, which was a combination of Solo Shell, which was a UK based inspection company, and Ocean Systems, which was a diving company. And uh, Ocean Systems uh, was the company that developed uh, the Navy's uh, as for bounce diving systems and the diving tables and all of that. And when they finished that contract, they had to figure out what to do. So they went, uh, came to Houston from Virginia and started uh, trying to work in the, uh, in the commercial oil field business. So that's, that's where I started. The Navy, you went from the Navy and then you ended up in business development somehow. I spent four years in the Navy. I was uh, lucky enough to get into diving and salvage, submarine rescue type uh, stuff. I learned a lot, did a lot, and um, wanted to use that uh, you know, in a career going forward. And commercial diving was the obvious place to, to look. And so uh, my intention was to get hired by a commercial diving company and the only way in initially was in corporate development which is not where I wanted to go I wanted to be in operations but I figured hey once I get in there I'll look around and see what I what I can do and hopefully get into operations which eventually happened only about six months later but then how did you end up at Oceaneering? Well, Oceaneering acquired uh, Solus Ocean Systems uh, a couple years later in early 1984 and I'll never forget that day I was uh, working in uh, the jungles of Brunei uh, and we had, uh, we had a, a couple of contracts there and the, uh, the teletype came in, this is old school, and so I came in early, I was always the first one in, and I took the tape out of the machine, ran it through to read it and print it out, and I said, oh, Oceaneering just acquired us. <laughs> That's how you find out. Yeah, I wonder what that means. <laughs> I wonder if I still have a job. <laughs> exactly. I would assume that that maybe changed the culture, maybe changed the company a little bit. Is that true? And if, and if so, how? I think that was a major aspect of uh, how Oceaneering developed, you know, over time. Uh, what really happened here was the merger of, I'll say, equals, uh, just from the point of view that we competed against each other everywhere in the world uh, for you know the uh, you know for the diving business. So we had uh, contracts, of course, between us everywhere. We had overhead everywhere too. So the combination was kind of the classic uh, MBO uh, you know test case where uh, you get to keep all the revenue of the combined companies. So that made the combined company healthy because up until that time, it was pretty episodic financially. Uh, you know, you'd be making a little money one year, you'd lose money the next year and whatnot. So this really gave the company some robustness from that point of view. Uh, it also brought the inspection uh, business into the company, which we you know, still have to this day. But it also brought a lot of uh, people into the company that ended up being uh, significant leaders in the future businesses of of the company. Dick Frisbee, for example, Kevin Cairns, Norm Gorman. You can see where this is going. Kevin McAvoy and I happen to be there as well. So, and there are many others. Um, and we were, we were very much more focused on the ROV business than Oceaneering was at that time. And you being a diver, what was that like watching that shift happen? Well, first of all, it didn't happen all of a sudden. Uh, it was kind of like watching grass grow. It took a long time. And one of the reasons it took a long time was that the infrastructure that existed subsea uh, had not been designed for remote intervention. It was designed for diver intervention. And so there was a long transition. Oceanary was a pioneer in the one atmosphere part of the business as, as work started getting deeper and divers couldn't really 
uh, you know, go that deep efficiently because of the decompression uh, protocols. And so that was, you know, one transition. But uh, it took quite a while before oil companies started designing uh, their subsidy infrastructure with remote operations in mind. You know, it took the better part of, you know, 15 plus years before the ROV really came into its own. And uh, of course, there were a lot of improvements made in ROV systems over that time period as well, which made more reliable and oil companies more willing to depend on them. What other dramatic changes have you seen in the oil and gas industries along your career? Well, I'd have to say the, the, the two biggest things are, you know, deeper and uh, more pressure in the reservoirs. And so these are, are problems that, uh, you know, that the oil companies had to solve. And uh, they took great risks in doing these things. And, uh, you know, but they got through them all. And, you know, we were able to help in our small way. But uh, those are the biggest changes, I think, that, that came through. Somehow, this oil and gas company gets into various other industries, like the entertainment industry, for example. It was it was pretty uh, serendipitous, actually. Uh, we had just completed uh, about a five-year program uh, with the Navy, developing a new deep water uh, ROV system and a deep ocean search system. And uh, we had a, an incredible team of engineers, software, mechanical, electrical. Uh, you know, team that, that uh, did this project. And then once it was over with, we knew, well, the Navy is not going to do another one of these for, for a while. What do we do with all these good people? We don't want to lose them. And so somebody saw a uh, request for uh, interest in redoing Universal Studios' uh, Jaws ride. But wasn't that like in a magazine or in a paper or something? Where that it was in, it was in of all places, the Commerce Business Daily, which is where the government publishes uh, their um, uh, upcoming uh, RFQs that they're going to put out there. And I, you know, it may, may seem odd. Why did they put it in there? Why was that in there? And I think maybe it's because they thought that the government contractors in uh, the, in the, you know, ocean space might be interested. And uh, so that's, that's how we found out about it. So, so we saw this opportunity, then what happened? We decided to, to bid on it and uh, we won it and we did the job successfully, but that's what started us off in, in the entertainment business. Somehow, we got into space systems working with NASA. Well, that, that's a lot more straightforward, actually. Is it? It is, because working in space is very similar to uh, working underwater. You've got zero gravity. Uh, you've got life support issues. Uh, you usually have to have some kind of tools to do what you're doing. And so we had a couple of folks in the organization Mike Gerhardt, uh, who uh, eventually went on to become an astronaut. Uh, Mark Gittleman, who ended up running our space uh, division for uh, quite a few years. But um, anyway, so they saw, you know what, uh, this is kind of like, you know, working out of a bell, uh, some C in a SAT system. Uh, we ought to go to NASA and tell them uh, that we understand how to work. And so they're doing EVAs. Uh, extravehicular activity where the astronaut goes out of the, out of his uh, environment in a spacesuit, pressure suit, and uh, and performs work. And some things they, they do with their hands, mostly they do with, with tools. And so we had a tooling business associated with our ROV business. We had the life support stuff, and we uh, thought we could help them evaluate, uh, you know, how to do these things. And at this time, Space Station headquarters had no idea how they were going to do this. Their idea of robotics was a automatic welding machine in a car factory, uh, which obviously, you know, is not going to work in outer space. Right. You have to, you know, figure out what to do as you're doing it, this sort of thing. So anyway, so we managed to uh, convince them that we could do this. And so they put us on a contract uh, to study 
uh, the different tasks that they knew were going to have to be done. And then later, um, you know, we managed to uh, design, test, and build, I think, upwards of 90-some percent of all of the tools that were used by the astronauts in assembling the space station. Okay, hang on. 90-something percent of the yeah. tools were designed by us yeah. to put the space station together. Yes. Really? Yeah. That's impressive. Going into uh, those businesses, the, the Navy business and the space business, uh, that gave us a, uh, you know, an image of high-tech technology. And it was true. Uh, and we have since gone way beyond that and, and, and truly are a technology company. Uh, but that's you know, what, what gave us that uh, image to begin with and gave us a lot of credibility. You work for NASA, you do stuff for them. Well, you could probably do stuff for us too. Right. Now all of a sudden we move into AGVs. We're moving. We're, we're moving stuff around warehouses. Well, that was really uh, a continuation of the entertainment business, really. And so the technology that allowed us to. Uh, have a, a cart, so to speak, that people sit in and move around uh, in a uh, in a uh, you know movie setting. Uh, is the same technology that we uh, started using to do to do uh, AGVs. And uh, again, it was a market that was uh, very immature, not much of a steady demand stream, and so it's taken quite a while for this to develop and take off. Not unlike the RV business, actually. Uh, but you can see it's happening, and I think the, you know, the really cool element in this is the people mover side of it, which is still using you know all the same technology to be able to move people around. You know, areas like parks, airports, uh, you know, uh, cities, even. You know, it's all electric, so there's no, uh, you know, no environmental issue either. So, Kevin, we're celebrating 60 years of oceaneering. What, I guess, I guess what are you looking forward to? I'm not going to say the next 60 because, but what are you, look, <laughs> what are you looking for, you know, coming up? What, what, what do you think the future holds? I think that oceaneering has shown an ability to be creative, uh, to be responsive, and to move with the time, so to speak. So, as things evolve out there, whether it's underwater or in space or, uh, or on land, I think our uh, employee culture is to recognize opportunities and say, hey, we could do something there. And so I don't know what it's going to be, uh, but I think that we will be players because, uh, because we like to play uh, and we're always moving on and, uh, and, and making better what we did before. So... I have high degree of confidence in that. I don't think it's normal to have the open door policy like we do at Oceaneering. Why is that? Well, I think it comes down to culture. And culture, I think, is one of the most important assets that a company can have. Uh, and culture happens from the top down. Uh, it does not happen from the bottom up. That was one of the first less management lessons I learned in the Navy, by the way. But at any rate, um, it, it's all about the, the feeling of teamwork, camaraderie, you know, fun stuff, interesting things to do uh, that we do. Uh, so I, I think that's why. Oceaneering has got a very hands-on management team. I know a lot of people from, you know, different parts of the world may say, you know, oh yeah, the guys are corporate, you know, they don't know what's going on. Uh, and that's probably true in some ways, but, uh, but more broadly, they are very involved and engaged. They travel around, they talk to people, they visit, uh, they know what the operations are, they know what's going on, and, and that is not common. I think the tendency in a lot of companies is for, you know, the corporate management to be uh, sequestered, you know, in their office and they don't get out much, they don't really, they don't really have that sense. And so uh, I think that's a huge difference. And in, 
in an operating company, my belief, and having observed you know other companies uh, and and how they've done things, you have got to have an operationally oriented leadership. Otherwise, you're going to lose the plot and uh, things are going to go south. So, Kevin, one of the things I always ask at the end of the interviews is, look, everybody's not going to remember everything that we talked about. OK, they, they attention spans are short these days. But let's say that there's one thing you want everyone watching this video to remember. What would that be? Well, first of all, there can never be only one thing. OK, give me two. OK, <laughs> well, I think, you know, anybody, you know, in your job, you need to have fun uh, at what you do. If you don't, you can have a pretty miserable life. Uh, but I think you need to work hard. Uh, you need to work with the people around you, um, be respectful of them. Uh, and the team approach to doing things is the only way that at least that oceaneering has succeeded. Uh, so I think that if, um, you know, if you keep those things in mind, then uh, you're going to be happy and uh, you're going to have a good, a good career. Awesome. I 100% agree. Kevin, thank you, sir. I know you're a busy man. Thanks for coming in and talking to me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good time.